Are you going to stream? No. Okay. <laughs> I, uh, I'm too fast, maybe. Sorry, Julian. <laughs> so if you don't mind, uh, I'll go through the reading of the policy of the Linux Foundation. Linux Foundation meetings involve participation by industry competitors. And it is the intention of the Linux Foundation to conduct all of its activities in accordance with the applicable antitrust and competition laws. It is therefore extremely important that in these, these meeting agendas and be aware of and not participate in any activities that are prohibited under the applicable US state level of foreign antitrust and competition laws. Examples of types of actions that are prohibited at Linux Foundation meetings and in connection with the Linux Foundation activities are described in the Linux Foundation Antitrust Policy. If you have questions about these matters, please contact your company council, or if you're a member of the Linux Foundation, feel free to contact Andrew of the Grove of the firm of Gaston of the Grove LLP, which provides legal counsel to the Linux Foundation. Appalachia is committed to creating a safe and welcoming community for all. More information, please visit our Hyperledger Code of Conduct. Perfect. I'll leave it on to you, Mr. Ravi, to, to explain to all of ourselves to say what to do and what quick say deals with. It's our pleasure to have you here today, by the way. And please take, take the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Really appreciate uh, uh, your introduction. And uh, thanks, everyone, for being here on a lovely uh, Tuesday afternoon. In Bangalore, we are enjoying a very pleasant weather after a series of rains. So hopefully, uh, we will have such weather continuing, I believe. Uh, quickly, uh, this presentation, uh, we I want to cover a little bit about uh, you know, beyond trade finance, you know, all of us, we have seen multiple trade finance platforms are addressing a very smart, uh, you know, way how they are solving uh, the internal global trade related issues when it comes to question of trade finance, there are multiple platforms. But I wanted to take a time a little bit, you know, outside the core trade finance uh, uh, platform and then see you know, what are all other value adds a blockchain technology like Hyperledger Fabric that can contribute to. So that is the, you know, this is the focus, you know, like last couple of years we have been uh, doing that. So I thought it is uh, today, uh, I wanted to uh, take some time to uh, present our experience and uh, what we have been doing with all of you. So I'm Ravi Jagannathan, founder and CEO of Kutsi Technologies. We, we started to treat technologies in 2016. It's a five year old, and we have about uh, experience of delivering 54 use cases, but 20 plus of them are in life. And we are a team of 40. Mostly we have a very strong cryptography, you know, engineering background. We have been working together last uh, uh, a decade plus. And uh, this venture was started five years ago, but collectively we have got uh, you know, together working experience of 10 plus years. And we are Hyperledger certified uh, organization. We are a HCSP. And our focus is primarily on, a, you know, developing IPs and products rather than just, uh, you know, giving services and working out because we believe that uh, blockchain technology is not like, you know, you just uh, deliver and come out. So it has to be beyond that. So that's why we thought we should be focusing more on an IP and product and probably a few of the uh, products or IPs I will walk you through in this presentation. We come with a very strong R&D tradition because our objective with which we started Kupsi was to make sure that we are able to take any tough technology to the street so that enterprises, government, consumers, everybody can use our technology without much uh, uh, challenges. So for that, definitely we need to have some R&D uh, mindset so we continuously do R&D to make sure that we are bridging that gap between the complexity of technology and uh, the end user uh, applications or uh, end user uh, uh, solutions. Fortunately, we have uh, uh, Fortune 500 clients as part of uh, our uh, 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 you know, client portfolio. So we, we started in 2016, as I was mentioning, 
We have close to about 30, 40 clients, 30 plus clients as of now, uh, about 20 plus applications went live. That's uh, in nutshell about Cripsy. So quickly coming to the, the trade finance and beyond that I was referring to. So if you see that, you know, the trade finance end to end, right? So whether it is a, a exporter to importer, uh, in between, there are so many constituents uh, who are part of the trade finance ecosystem. All of them play a very significant role. And the process itself is very, you know, highly, uh, uh, it has to be a, a secure and a very trustworthy ecosystem because uh, you are dealing in uh, millions and millions of dollars worth of uh, uh, consignment that is flowing from one, uh, one uh, party to the other party and in between uh, there are multiple intermediaries who are handling those consignments and documents and you know, a whole lot of stuff. So it's a very tough uh, uh, you know, uh, ecosystem. Uh, but currently, what are hyperledger-based uh, trade finance platforms that we have? Typically, it automates the, the trade finance business process in a very smart way. But I, I feel that there are much more uh, that uh, as a technology, Apple is a fabric uh, you know, or a blockchain technology can deliver certain critical needs that the industry has. Uh, I'm a chartered accountant, so I used to uh, practice before I started my technology life. So I used to practice, I used to do a lot of consulting for uh, uh, the global uh, multinational companies in uh, the global trade, you know, getting some uh, a line of credits established with banks. So that's what I was doing. So, in 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 my that part of uh, the work, you know career, I realized that there should be a technology that can provide for total automation, which is essential. And uh, also, there should be a possibility of enhancing liquidity of the entire trade finance uh, ecosystem. So also you know, resolving disputes. There could be disputes coming all over. So there should be an ability to resolve disputes. An important point is how do they prevent frauds that are happening because banks are being, uh, you know, taken for a ride with uh, some, uh, uh, you know, duplicate uh, bill of lightings, invoices, and a whole lot of stuff. And not only that, it should be affordable for all. We can put a kind of, you know, the best in, class technology, but if it is not affordable to one segment, for example, if there is a company exporting in Bangladesh or a different you know, part of the world, if they, if they cannot use this system, probably this system may not be, uh, it will not take off because there is one particular constituent who is not part of the ecosystem, then the trade finance uh, platforms may not take off or you know, the adoption uh, will be challenged. So given these needs, you know, we thought, how do we, you know, bring in certain technologies as a peripheral to this trade finance platform and plug it with trade finance platform so that all these needs can be addressed in a meaningful way. So that's what we have been doing. And I thought in today's presentation, I want to present that as well. So the first uh, uh, part uh, uh, of uh, uh, our offering, I would say is a, uh, a crypto. A crypto is a kind of you know layer two hyperledger solution because layer two typically in a crypto world means uh, uh, you know many things. But here in hyperledger solution, how do we make it make any solution affordable for all the constituents? The return on investment or the benefit that all the constituents they are going to get from this uh, uh, hyperledger fabric uh, platform or solution should be adequate enough irrespective of the size, irrespective of the kind, or irrespective of the domain. So that is the objective with which we started crypto, because we believe that having a right kind of a layer two uh, platform can help to optimize the investment in the technology and spread the benefit across all the participants who can get those benefits at an affordable price. That is the a basis, or a, that is a very core purpose for, with which we have uh, developed our crypto. It's a typical technology stack. If you see, this is how it looks, you know, end of the day, 
cloud is the, with the nuts and bolts and boxes and the, the whole lot of uh, infrastructure that is held in the cloud. And on top of that is Hyperledger, which is a very logical layer, which is completely, you know, for anything that we can think of uh, enterprise grade blockchain, it's inside Hyperledger. Now, on top of that is uh, our uh, Crypt Core, which is the layer two I was referring to. So it's, uh, it has got its own interactive modules for developing, deploying, managing, whatever way you can think of, of any your use case. So if, uh, if you are thinking about a trade finance use case, we can use <laughs> Is there any questions? Uh, please mute yourself. Uh, those who... yeah. So now if you're thinking about a, a trade finance uh, use case, probably we can just focus on trade finance use case, bring all smart uh, you know, uh, uh, problem solving techniques that, uh, that we wanted to bring in and then leave all other challenges relating to Hyperledger and cloud-related matters, infrastructure-related matters that crypto can take care. Yeah. That's uh, how uh, we have uh, kind of created a crypto in this hierarchy of any use case solution, blockchain or Hyperledger fabric use case solution. Now, we, as we know that technology is very, very complex. Now, the complex technology has to be addressed in a very different way. So what we have done is we have created certain modularized approach. Uh, I'll start from uh, one o'clock, you know, deployer. For example, uh, deploying hyperledger fabric, we can do in multiple ways, but it, you know, the, uh, at a deployment stage, we should be very, very clear about what kind of a network we are thinking about and what kind of a optimal infrastructure is required how we can scale and how we can avoid any challenges during the production. And then a deployer, we, we have to deploy Hyperledger Fabric, you know, just Hyperledger Fabric deployment, anybody can do at a POC level, at a lab level. But for the, if you have to think about uh, a critical uh, a solution like trade finance, if you are talking about that kind of an, creating a network, it has been well thought through. So in our deployer module, we have got all these, you know, important critical aspects taken care, of, and then it, you know, we deploy the deployer module takes care of uh, not only deploy, deploying the Hyperledger fabric, uh, 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 it also takes care of certain uh, uh, infrastructure related uh, matters deployed alongside. For example, if you are talking about, uh, you know, a Kubernetes services based uh, uh, clusters, how it can be deployed depending on, you know, uh, your, your network that you want to have. Of whether you want to have a, 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 a you know federated or a simple hyperledger uh, or stat, you know systems, depending on that you can you can deploy. And the important aspect next one is wrapper because now you have deployed. Now you are going to have a use case. We know that. Now how that use case is going to interact with hyperledger fabric? Are we going to build this time and again for every application that we are developing? Probably that should not be the case. That should be certain time-tested standard approach. So that's a wrapper that we have created. It facilitates in a seamless way, interaction between a client and HLF network. Because all of us, we know there are so many challenges when it comes to you know, chain code and uh, you've got certain policies and all those things should be taken care. So we clearly understood all those challenges in our five years experience and this wrapper takes care of it. Next to the studio is a, you know, one of the, I, I like that, Studio module. The studio module is a low code. Almost 95 or 97 percent of your coding effort is removed. If you know what you want, for example, if you take an answer scenario, 10 points. Okay, I know uh, uh, you know from exporter to importer. In between, there are parties. We break it by events, and we 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 bring certain data points within the events, and then we also associate that with the users for their entitlement and we create a business rule layer on top of that. So once this is done, now we have a drag and drop uh, module where you can go and define. And then once you do, then the studio deploys. Uh, we have a master smart contract. We take all these uh, uh, you know, 
parameter values and then we deploy that in our smart smart, uh, smart contract or studio once you do it then it, your apis are ready then you can think about how you want to create an interface to ui or the line of business solutions then the, you know that's how we have modularized uh, or rather created that studio as a module then comes your fabric admin you've got so many uh, uh, administration uh, related uh, aspects to be taken care of when it comes to the question of fabric, whether it is a new organization coming on board or a channel or sometimes, you know, systems going down. There are so many things. All of them are, you know, we have, we have created a nice UI based approach with the full controls. Then the fabric admin module takes care of the, uh, uh, the, the continuous availability of the network that we are creating. And data lake is, uh, again, we wanted to make sure that the query uh, is not happening directly to the ledger, but at the same time, business might want certain information, both for, uh, you know, pops up or, or reporting or querying or uh, APIs, whatever way we created that data lake. The data lake uh, takes care of all the, uh, the, the business related information sharing uh, matters. And finally, we have a verification as a service layer because whatever we do, Apology Fabric is considered as a permission ledger. Of course, it is a permission ledger. It's considered as a, a limited network. So sometimes we may have to you know, expose some of our information that can be publicly verifiable. So we created a, another uh, a, a module called verification as a service. Here we used a, a, a third generation protocol, Edera. So HLF information, hypothetical fabric related information, whatever we wanted to harden it further, we have created this was to take it to Edera. And then if you want to bring it back to your use, uh, you know, any uh, workflows, then the data can come to Edera's uh, mirror net. Now the data is back available to you and you can give it to third party. For example, somebody is giving an invoice. I may get, give it invoice uh, to my immediate uh, uh, customer. If the customer wants to give it to the bank, and the bank need not come to my system to verify whether the invoice is uh, uh, valid or not. They can go to Hedera or in a public network, they'll be able to verify. That's a, just a small uh, uh, example. Now with this modularized approach so far, whatever networks that we have created, these are all the, you know, our customers, they believe that this is what the people did to that. Number one, the resource dependency. In one, one of our uh, customer scenario, they were not even able to move uh, from uh, uh, POC to production because they had very, very serious resource uh, uh, constraint. So with this kind of a module, probably they were able to, uh, uh, you know, somebody is asking me a question. Yeah, so then operational cost, we are, we, are, we are reducing the operational cost in multiple ways because, right, because it's well-structured, uh, layer two. So with that kind of a standard structured uh, system, your operational cost is absolutely, you know, reduced. For example, one of our clients used to say that, uh, including our CapEx, you were saying that we were, uh, you know, uh, we were at one third cost at three times faster. Maybe because of the way that we have structured our uh, uh, the code, uh, we were able to help uh, our clients with uh, reducing the operational cost. The purpose of reducing the operational cost is to make the hyperledger fabric solution affordable for all the participants. And shortening the time to market, because uh, typically we take about three weeks for POC and probably you know, maximum about uh, 12 to 15 weeks for production, because uh, we can go iteratively, it's a low code and uh, all other uh, components are readily available and your report builder is, you know, like your data lake is there for you to query. So the time consuming activities were reduced so that the time to market is shortened. The time to market, when you shorten, your capex comes down. When your capex comes down, then we are talking about the improving the economic viability. So this is, uh, you know, of course, improved immutability achieved through uh, our uh, Hedara connected verification as a service. So now stepping, you know, little away from Tripcore, of course, we have done some. Uh, very uh, interesting uh, networks we have created certain programs for a mining and mineral industry to banks. You know, this is again a trade finance related use case, which is creating high liquidity for that industry. Because we are talking about, uh, I'm going to show a, a, a quick demo of this uh, platform, you know, towards the end. 
Uh, the, the objective is today an exporter bank sitting in certain location like Bangladesh, they do not have access to a buyer who may be sitting in, a, in the US or in, uh, in Europe or in Dubai, wherever they are, or Singapore, because the market is so vast and it is close to about four, five trillion market size. And the, it is a illiquid assets are like, you know, 60 to 90 days window. So for somebody to figure out where this asset is or somebody to figure out where the buyers are, it's going to be tough. So that's where we created a marketplace. And this marketplace consists of 70 plus banks today. Now the, the, they, are, they know where exactly the, uh, the, the assets are. And because it is connected in the blockchain, there is an immutability. There are a whole lot of trust that everything comes in. So that marketplace is, you know, more, uh, you know, powered with the, the hyperledger fabric uh, uh, and uh, blockchain uh, techniques. So now the banks are comfortable in uh, dealing uh, with, uh, with, with such illiquid assets. We, we have created an inter-European trade mode network for the VAT and as well as uh, other export related or a uh, global uh, cross-border related uh, 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 exchange of data and uh, micro lending platform we have created uh, for an Indian uh, uh, scenario and coffee supply chain we did between uh, 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 Africa and uh, Europe. The entire farming or uh, uh, farmers in Africa they are connected in the network uh, until it is going to the consumer who is drinking coffee. And uh, recently we have just deployed a, an a, a aerospace industry network for a US client and uh, another uh, logistic industry network for another less client. These are all the network already running in crypto. So if you see such a you know, powerful network, if you have to run, then you need to have a very strong uh, platform. And that platform should support not just a development in the production, not only just the infrastructure, it has to take care of the fabric related uh, and the use case related aspects as well. And it should provide for scaling. So that's exactly what uh, uh, we were able to achieve through Crypto. Then next part is after uh, the, the Crypto, uh, we are also into uh, the digital bill of lighting. Uh, I personally, I was a designated a blockchain uh, champion in uh, UN CFAC, which we built a workfare, uh, 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 along what two and a half years, uh, you know, uh, continuous workshops to derive uh, a, a white paper that became uh, a, a base for ICCs to take and then run, uh, you know, create a standard for electronic bill of lading. So the, all of us, we know a trade finance, any platform for that reason, without any digital bill of lading as an asset. That is a definitely, it is not a total automation. We are talking about a, a breakage and uh, still the fraud can happen. So that issue can be solved only through EBL. And we have done EBL in a very smart way. We have tokenized uh, the bill of lighting because the underlying asset or a consignment that is represented by the bill of lighting is very, very, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it has to be secured. And uh, it has to be, the ownership has to be, you know, uh, tightly monitored. So given that we have uh, create, uh, we, have, we have developed a tokenized uh, uh, bill of lighting concept and that EBL, for example, we have done, an, you know, in, in our system, it is a non-fungible token because we wanted to make sure that every consignment that is, uh, that the EBL uh, represent is in the form of non-fungible token so that the ownership at any point in time can be, uh, you know, clearly, transparently available to anyone who wants to validate, and there cannot be an another, uh, you know, similar consignment possible because every consignment is unique. So that's why we have created non-fungible token-based uh, EBL uh, system, and it's completely complying with the global trade standards like ICC, DCSA, you know, you name it. And we also created a verifiable the public network using Hedera network because so in, at some point in time. That verification is very, very essential. If, for example, bringing all the participants into the ecosystem may not be possible to begin with. If, for example, if a shipper or a, you know, a logistic company, he wants to, they, they can generate EBL and then it is going to the shipper. Assuming the bank is also part of this ecosystem, an exporter bank, and after that, if the importer bank, they do not want to be part of the system. They should be able to download and then take it to, to the next level while 
they do this until that point in time it is verified in the public network so some kind of uh, because until it scales up you need those kind of a flexibility so we created the verifiable in the public network as a as a one of the features and completely api approach because all these constituents are very very uh, seriously they, they have invested there are you know a lot of investment in their technology assets we do not want to question the technology assets or change the technology assets uh, you know the 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 way they are working so we create an api approach model so that this can sit on top of the existing technology ecosystem and it can it can interact with line of business solution and the information flows between multiple blockchain system is also possible because these tokens are very unique and we can create a token as an asset and then we can continue in a, any trade finance platform that uh, you, we are party to so that's uh, the ebl and just uh, you know i'm not going to go deep into this it's just a matter of uh, all the participants there is a you know the flow of uh, the trade this is how it is going to be and all the participants they are participating and the movement of uh, uh, the the bl is uh, you know taken care by through the uh, nft tokens that, that they are moving uh, you know from one party to the other party and we used the hyperledger fabric and hedera as two important you know distributed ledger systems in this ecosystem so next uh, i was talking about this verification as a service uh, briefly now the challenge is you know as i was mentioning uh, it's it's a permission ledger and it is limited access right so it's a kind of a closed loop and uh, the perception is how far i can rely on that information or how far i can access that information so the only way that we can do is take it to some kind of a public network information whichever information that we wanted to you know the, you know take it to the public network probably we can allow that to happen and from the public network again we can bring back uh, information into any platform for example the hyper, the trade finance platform for our internal workflows so this way we are adding the the enhancing the immutability value and adding uh, the increasing the Uh, trust portion that's how the verification as a service uh, layer helps so this is how we have connected again you know it helps in uh, reducing the document fraud completely auditable and real time and you know it becomes a strong evidence because uh, now we can reduce the disputes using this kind of uh, techniques the here hyperledger fabric program is connected to our cryptsy wasp while we have got our own workflows and our own uh, you know uh, uh, way of uh, taking uh, the hash from hyperledger fabric and then take it to hedera and then make sure certain metadata related information is also flowing in and then again bring back the information if the if it has to come back to the hyperledger fabric program or anybody wants to verify they can verify in hedera network itself this, this is how we have architected that verification as a service layer this one is a very important uh, i would i would consider this as a very important uh, you know technique uh, that might be required in the long term in a in a low touch economy number one and number two with so much of you know high value items flowing from one party to other party and high seas transactions happening so there are so many things happening in this uh, global trade now we can eliminate fraud it in, in, in by certain ways by making sure that the electronic bill of lading tokenization all those stuff but still if we can create a platform where the interaction is not just happening through like a you know a, a data entry you know if an interactions can be captured at the time of the discussion a transaction itself for example if a, if a bank and a exporter if they are talking if that can be through a video transaction platform by applying certain very strong techniques for assuring that the party whoever is in the video is the person who is supposed to be and the video is real and there are certain data that we are able to capture from that video and then we can put that on you know behind the screen there is a trade finance standard operating procedure then when we stitch this these things together probably we can create a fantastic uh, api that takes all the information that captures in the video transaction and then that can be plugged into trade finance platform now there is a, absolutely there is a zero uh, a fraud that can happen and uh, the transparency is extremely high and it is uh, completely auditable so now this is something 
we have, of course, the view board is real. There are two banks already they are using for different use cases, but the view board is a more a transaction platform. So it's a, as I was mentioning, you know, all these uh, uh, features are included uh, in, in view board. And most importantly, this is what I think the, we have got three layers, you know, one is uh, the, uh, Yeah, one is on the, the authentication side. You can you can verify the identity, facial recognition to make sure that the person is uh, whoever is in the video is the person who I'm I'm talking. For example, if I'm talking to somebody in a remote location, I should I should uh, know because uh, uh, take for example a bank. You know, how do you know that uh, a person in a bank is the person whom you are interacting with? You know, it could be that could be a fraud, right? So then a location verification. We will make sure that I am talking to someone. If that someone is in a bank, the bank's location is also captured and liveliness check. We want to make sure that the video is not just a kind of, a, you know, behind somebody is running a video, but it's a real video. Then comes your question of e-signing smart contract, who's your capture automation. It's all at a transaction level. And finally, at a compliance level, you want to make sure that uh, the standard operating procedures are driving for a, a, a audit and verifiable uh, transaction and stored in an immutable way. And IPFS use for you know your video uh, a file sharing and then finally a distributed ledger. It could be a, you know our trade finance if you are connecting then probably the distributed ledger is a hyperledger fabric or if you want to have a, just a hash uh, and bring back that hash to our uh, trade finance uh, hyperledger fabric trade finance system, it could be Hedera as well. So VBoard is a very powerful framework. Uh, I would say will be extremely helpful for a high value transaction and also to make sure that there is no dispute and completely auditable and verifiable and uh, your uh, standard operating procedure that once put in place, that takes care of uh, the entire flow of information and the decisioning, whatever is happening within the system through smart contracts. Then, uh, as I was mentioning the day about trade asset, it's a marketplace for banks. It's you know, about 70 banks already onboarded. This is uh, we developed for our uh, uh, client of uh, FinTech Innovation International, DMCC, uh, uh, you, you know, situated in Dubai. Uh, it's about three years ago we started uh, developing. We, we brought it to production within about six months' time. They were onboarding more banks. Recently, I think uh, they have concluded one billion uh, worth of transactions in this platform in this uh, 2021. So that's the just the beginning of you know the, the large scale uh, trade that we can see in this platform. A quick look at the platform. You know, I want to share a video. So this entire platform is end to end developed by us on Cryptcore. So it has got a bilateral communication as well because all such a large deals cannot happen just uh, one party saying that this is my asset and you buy it. it. There has to be some mechanism to interact. So we have created the bilateral communication. That is also becoming part of the evidence in the system. And uh, Ravi, um, thank you for sharing so far. You're saying that this platform's in production somewhere or is being tested? Sorry? Uh, is this is this trade assets in production? Or? Yeah, yeah, it is in production. It is in production and uh, a billion dollar worth of transaction already happened in this uh, uh, 2021. And they are expecting a uh, five, 10 X volume in the, in the years to come. Okay, thank you.
Yeah, all this information, if you see, the, the respective banks are getting the information through API from their existing system. It's not like, you know, we expect them to do a data entry because it's a duplication, there could be errors and all those stuff. So we provided a complete uh, API first approach. Through that approach, uh, we were able to get all the information into the system and then the trade is happening in a smooth way, yeah. So that said, uh, yeah, it's 40 minutes now. I'm well within the time. Uh, I wanted to check if there are any questions or any suggestions I can uh, take. Somebody is in the chat, let me check. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Ravi, by the way. Uh, let me check the, the chat. Uh, there is, hold on. A question by Sergei Cherishev. And I can read through this. The trolling bill of lading would only work if there is government regulation that obliges all participants to switch to the bill of lading as the only proof of time of title. Okay, this is the remark. I don't know whether the wants to take the word, but they. Uh, I agree. I agree. Uh, it has to be, you know, by uh, the government regulation should set in. And uh, it's not too far because ICC has given uh, their uh, uh, guidelines, the rule book. And uh, now United Nations is also inisatural through inisatural. They have also, um, uh, you, you know, announced that the digital uh, uh, export or global trade documents are allowed. Once that is done, it has to come to the next level to all the governments. And when the, all the governments, and they are all eager. It's not like, you know, we have, we have discussed with many government representatives uh, during our workshop. They are all eager because uh, they're waiting for such things to happen. Because if you see all the governments, their systems are digital. So this paper-based uh, uh, bill of lading is a big barrier for them to automate their system. So there will not be any, because the, it's not a government regulation. Okay, yeah, I would say, for example, if you are talking about uh, RBI, they should say, yeah, we are accepting a uh, bill of lading. That's to that extent, yes, it's a regulation. So it's not too far. But your question of whether until then both the paper and uh, uh, digital bill of lading, you know, parallelly uh, uh, will create some kind of a challenge, you're right. But technically, in this short term, we are coming out with some techniques. For example, we'll, we'll put a token. And then the take token can move from party to party. At some point in time, say after three stops, if that they want to download, they do not want to continue with the token because they don't have a system. They can download. When they download, it clearly going to say that this is the token and this is where you can verify and this is the only original uh, document. And until this point in time, the history you can verify in this link. All those information will be available, and then that you know paper based or a PDF document, whatever it is, it can move from that point onwards. So it can create a problem, but with the completely paper-based you know, model, what we have will throw much more problems than what we are trying to, but sometimes such change will have to go through some you know, interim processes. That's what we are doing. Uh, Mr. Ravi, there's a second question always by Mr. Sergei. Second question is that, uh, trade asset looks like a general marketplace. Is it using the hyperledger as means that? Why do you need to use DLT tech for it anyway? A settlement happens outside the platform. Well, trade asset it has got a, you know, yeah, it is a, it is a network where there are multiple nodes and multiple participants are owning that nodes and the data is available. Uh, you know, through PDC and other concepts, it's all available in those nodes. And it is up to the banks to decide whether they want to participate in the ecosystem by being owner of the node. We have also created a, another model where it's a shared node. We have created a proxy node. If you bank, you want to come, you don't want to be part of the network as a, you know, a, a, a participant in the network at an infrastructure level, you can, at, at a node level, you can continue to do the transaction. Because from 2016 until now, we have seen the hyperledger fabric adoption in stages. You know, early stages in 2016, 2017, when we deployed, it was 100% single authority solution for an enterprise. 
that's how it started but that evolved you know over a period of time we were able to scale those platform to a different level that uh, you know scaling should happen will happen here we have provided for all those scale when it assuming that we are talking about a, you know like a 5 trillion economy this this market place right when we, we we cross that for example you know 100 million then we are sorry 100 billion then we are going to see a lot of banks i mean interest to participate in this network because their assets are part of this under audit internal audit system would require some you know participation in the ecosystem and hyperledger fabric is also technology is also you know uh, uh, getting adopted and getting mainstream so all these things will converge at that point in time this will be a powerful dlt network it is just a matter of time thanks mr ravi uh, this is another question by mr tatin yap the idea of tokenizing bill of lading is good how would you commercialize it that's also a very interesting question yeah i think uh, at the least uh, what is uh, what the the bill is doing is just replacing the paper based uh, uh, bill right so now there is a definite cost comparison between the paper based bill and uh, 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 digital bill as a company cryptsy subjective is to run network and platform that can reasonably give a, a very good benefit for all the participants at a transaction level approximately 50 dollars and above and if they are benefiting 50 dollars and above any participant in the ecosystem not necessarily a bill any network that we are running then we would like to share the benefits along with our participants so our model is to make sure at a bill level there is a benefit and there is a cost and there is a subscription as well so we will run the network large companies would like to be part of that network you know be part of the node network so they will have their own nodes and they will run their own infrastructure and there are some small companies who would still want to be part of the system maybe a you know a small uh, uh, you know freight forwarder he doesn't want to have his you know, uh, infrastructure cost and other stuff he may not be able to manage it as well for them we will provide a shared mode where they can come and participate and then get the bill be part of the bill journey and for them we will charge them different pricing it will be affordable but at the same time depending on how they are participating in the network hope i address uh, the question yeah. Okay. So, uh, Mr. Ravi, just one question. Uh, you may mention to coffee trading and stuff like this. Uh, how do you see, I mean, in terms of perspective, your solution being framed within the new trend called ESG, uh, environments, social impact, and governance? How do you see the next steps from Cryptsy into this specific space? Yeah, so ultimately, you know, a technology, blockchain technology is a foundational technology. It has to do much, much, much foundational changes in the ecosystem. So we are not looking at blockchain just replacing uh, existing uh, business process, right? That any, you know, uh, your ERP systems can do or any software can do. Definitely, then you are running a, 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 a you know a Mercedes Benz uh, at a five kilometer or a five mile speed. So that's not going to help. So now we are talking about how this blockchain can ultimately, when it goes to the mainstream and then keep when more participants coming into the system, ultimately, what are all the key benefits that we can expect? So one of the key benefits is definitely you know all, you know the carbon uh, uh, footprint related, the sustainability related. For example, we did one project for. Uh, a beer manufacturer, you know, the Henneken, they have uh, openly in the public network, they have uh, in, in their website itself, it is mentioned, where for every bottle of beer, they wanted to show to the consumer about their, the, the social responsibility. They, are, they want to show what is the water consumed for the bottle, but particular bottle of water. It is not like a, you know, a static, it is dynamic. And what is the sustainability factor? The carbon footprint for that particular bottle of water, because uh, uh, sorry, beer. So if that beer, for example, if there is a you know a, a transportation or a truck company 
if they are moving that beer from a point to point in Europe, for example, they may be using a low carbon uh, consuming or a more carbon uh, uh, you know, emitting uh, ecosystem. But the same one, probably if you are thinking about in India or uh, any other part of you know, like Bangladesh and other countries, probably we are using some diesel based uh, you know, truck system where the carbon emission will be high. So depending on all these information, we have created an algorithm and we were able to produce that information in a distributed ledger that is available for the consumer who can trust and believe that this is something which I can have because it is not going to create any massive issue for the ecosystem or a, a environment. So this is one example. Now imagine we are already talking about the coffee grower in, uh, in Ethiopia. We are already talking about green uh, farming. Now, when it comes to green farming, how are they going to be compensated? Because that is very important. Because in Africa, if somebody is, you know, putting some efforts to make sure that there is a, you know, climate related issues that I am going to, you know, take care of to my, to my extent, then somebody should be giving him some incentive. That incentive can happen only in a distributed network or a blockchain uh, technology. For example, if somebody says that, okay, if uh, I have said say, 10 kilogram of uh, uh, carbon uh, emission in, the, in my farming of one acre of uh, you know, coffee uh, uh, plantation, immediately he will get a carbon offset token. That carbon offset token is a valuable uh, uh, token that can be you know, traded in a uh, carbon uh, exchange. Now, this is how I think um, the, the entire you know, DLT and blockchain technology, we need to reach that stage. And if we have to reach that stage, we need to start somewhere. We are just starting as a you know, marketplace or a supply chain or a prison track or a prominence. These are all the use cases that we are doing. But we are already seeing it's progressing towards to the, those kind of a foundational value that a blockchain uh, you know, can bring to the table. Perfect. Thank you so much, Mr. Ravi. And uh, another adding to that point, you know, in that same platform, we have created a, 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 the provenance is not just about that this coffee is grown in this particular land. It's also about certain certificate that the African or Ethiopian government has given. Okay, this is the, you know, you, it's, uh, it's, you have not used any chemical fertilizer. All those informations are also available as part of your provenance. Now you are convinced that when I have a coffee, I'm convinced that okay, this is coming through this, you know, the sustainability factors or anything that is concerning to me as an individual and also as a society. Perfect. Thank you so much. This is pretty interesting, sir. I'll leave it on to attendance once again, and Julie maybe to, to ask some questions to Mr. Ravi. Julian, what do you think? It was a great, great presentation, right? And you covered so many different in Mind Hub, the trade assets, all these wonderful, uh, these wonderful yeah. programs. So I, I, uh, I'm not sure which one to ask questions about, actually, really. But, but maybe I ask a broader question. Where do you see, you talk about the attributes, where do you see the blockchain? How, how do you see it evolving now, particularly in trade finance? Um, yeah. Yeah. Huh? The, the missing elements were, uh, as yeah. I was mentioning, the digital uh, document in the system yeah. because uh, the acceptance of the, those documents. Now we have got a, you know, blessings from the UN and the large uh, institutions. So it will unfold. And uh, that journey is going to take this trade finance to uh, probably, you know, 50, 60 X levels. All transaction the, the the supply chain platform, for example, Mind Hub, what we have developed, you know, now already they have started inter, uh, interfacing with another trade uh, finance platform. So those things are happening now. That kind of uh, you know uh, 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 the, the network effect, you know, the technology network effect, I would say, will kind of take this trade finance uh, 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 platforms to a different level. I would say, you know. In the next 12 to 24 months, you will see the complete uh, uh, transformation of uh, trade finance industry using blockchain technology. And Hyperledger is leading that uh, 
uh, <laughs> that, that that part of uh, the technology world, you know that. Yeah, which is great. So, 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 how do you see interoperability then? Right. So, you talk about multiple chains. Uh, is do you see interoperability starting to happen? Or yeah, the asset definition layer is uh, helping because if you're yeah. talking about the, the important aspect is asset because there's a consignment moving from party to party. That yeah. is represented by a bill of lading. If that asset, if you can yeah. create that as an interoperable one, for example, NFTs are interoperable, right? Yes. And it can be, now if you see across all platforms, even Hyperledger Fabric, we are able to, you know, uh, consume uh, an NFT from uh, the third, uh, because it's just a technology helps you to make sure that it is verifiable and also you can use in your uh, uh, platform. So that is a very core interoperable uh, aspect. Other than that, at a transaction level, interoperability, it is definitely a challenge, but I don't know, I don't think it is required because if I'm party to the, the asset interoperability is required, outside of that, I may have a different process, I may have a different uh, a ledger, I want to use that asset, I can use. It all depends on users, convenience, and their, uh, you know, what kind of a, a platform they are having, that's all. And going towards a very tightly interoperable or an integrated model, in my understanding, it's going to be tough. You can think about having some intermediary techniques and technologies. It's not going to be 100%. There's a read now from uh, one of my contacts, Mr. Joseph Hooper from Ghana. He's asking whether coffee solution is adaptable to cocoa and cashew industry, which is a big deal in Africa, especially Western Africa. But I guess the answer is pretty positive, isn't it, uh, Mr. Ravi? Yeah, I think the cocoa is already we have deployed, though I call it as a coffee chain. It's done for uh, the other bar, that is the uh, brand. They use the same, uh, they, they use, you know, for a different kind of a business purpose. They, they use, number one, showing the provenance, and also they created uh, a loyalty program on top of uh, the, the network that we have created. Uh, because uh, every uh, chocolate bar you are getting, there's a QR code inside the wrapper. You can scan, you can connect to the system. Imagine how else are you going to connect in a consumer world? Connecting a consumer to your system is going to be very, very, very tough. You know, that's why, you know, uh, the uh, Nestle's and others, you know, you, you can't give loyalty. You know, it's through retail chain only you can get. But here, when I click the QR code, I can select to either uh, donate some uh, my, my reward to the farmer who actually, you know, cultivated that uh, uh, in a cocoa bean. For him, I can give some uh, planter tree tokens. Or I can keep that in my system, in my wallet, use those tokens for buying, you know, and, you know next time when I buy a chocolate, whatever. it's a loyalty program that we have done. So it is already done, cocoa. Cashew we have not done, it's a good idea. Probably we are waiting for somebody to, you know, look at this platform, yeah. It's pretty interesting. I mean, value chain and how to transpose this one into the blockchain is a big deal, especially in Africa also in Southeast Asia, I guess. So the feeling I got that blockchain indeed can step in as a major actor in changing the actual value chain and giving access to finance in more general terms to the very poorly finance nowadays. Actually, we did uh, for our client in the uh, Netherlands, this project, you know, it's called Fairchain Foundation. So Fairchain Foundation, uh, supported by the UN, you know, those kind of organizations and uh, I guess this organization supported them because they wanted to make sure the value distribution is, you know, available for all the participants to see and also to make sure for the farmer, they're, 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 you know, it's, it's not like somebody taking advantage of the farmer situation. So the value distribution is very important because one of the SDG goals is uh, the poverty related. To address that, UN is promoting this and we have also created the value distribution uh, reporting in, uh, in our uh, layer. So anybody can see and then uh, uh, make sure that the farmer is getting what he deserves. Nice topic, Mr. Ravi. By the way, thank you thank so you. much. There's a message from 
Congratulate with you. Yeah. Perfect. So, so I think gonna run. Great presentation, Ravi. Thank you. All the best. Also, take care. Bye bye. Awesome, Appreciate that. Okay. Good. Perfect. Julian, I think we we can close this one by thanking Mr. Ravi. It was indeed a very powerful presentation. And I'm delighted, literally, to have you here today with us. We're going to meet in two weeks' time again, having another time slot in my early afternoon so here in Central Europe. So I would love to thank Mr. Ravi for being with us today and hope to see you soon again soon. All right. Take care, everybody. Take care. Thanks, Andre. Thanks, Ravi. Bye. Bye. Bye.